In chapter 3, we're going to look at describing data using numerical measures. So our assumption is that we have genuine quantitative information for which it makes sense to do mathematical computations and do arithmetic operations on. So things like gender, social security, student ID, things like that are not going to be suitable for what we're doing here. Now, assuming we have genuine uh, numbers that we can actually work with and get meaningful descriptive measures from here is a list of things that we would like to do in this chapter this chapter we're going to talk about the measures of central tendency namely arithmetic mean median and mode we're going to also look at standard deviation and variance there are other measures of central tendency and measures of what we call dispersion that's what the standard deviation is deviation or dispersion but we're just going to focus on those okay now our measures of central tendency here the idea is that suppose i have a collection of data so i have some quantitative information and uh, i would like to be able to find uh, perhaps what is the most common value in my data um, what is the center of this data if you think in terms of like the center of gravity the centroid of the data what is the most typical score I could expect from this data so that's the idea of measures of center that we're going to talk about now the three of these that you look at I'm going to give you the formula for one of them the first formula of our course is this one this is Greek mu and near the end of this lecture you're going to see a list of these greek alphabets and the correct pronunciations and they're all summarized in a in a display for you so this is greek mu like the sound of a cat mu and uh, mu means population mean or arithmetic mean the arithmetic mean here the reason for the word arithmetic is because we have for example harmonic mean we have geometric mean we have weighted mean so this really narrows it down to which kind of mean uh, we're looking at this is your everyday average okay so for example let's say you take four exams 100 points each and say what is my average that's the kind of average that we're talking about here we call it the mean simply the mean so we have two uh, of these measures one for the population one for the sample and in fact uh, in statistics there are two formulas two for every parameter that we are looking at or a statistic there are two formulas for whatever we do for example if i want to calculate the average there are two formulas for the average as you can see one of them is for the population how you would do it if you had the entire all the scores the other one is for the partial scores right the sample now a lot of times these as you can see the formulas are quite similar to each other the key difference is in the denominator capital n is the population size the little n is the sample size but how we go about computing them it makes no difference so for example if i want to know what is the average balance on a credit card i can take a sample of let's say 50 uh, people at random uh, in a shopping mall and that would be n or if i have access to let's say database at visa or mastercard or american express that would constitute a population and that would be capital n this would be tens of millions of scores as opposed to 20 50 whatever i can afford to collect here so that's what we're doing here now this other sigma there are two sigma in greek alphabet we'll look at both of those in this video this sigma is a mathematical operator okay and the mere presence of sigma is a command to add so the the symbol interpretation of the symbol itself it means these three words so anywhere you see this in our formulas that means the sum of although we display the formulas by the way for most of what we do a lot of times we will not display the formulas for you because primarily in this course we're going to be using software whether we use megastat or we use minitab sas spss or any other software that's accessible to you excel so for that reason we're not going to really emphasize on the formula so much and details of the computation as opposed to interpretation of the output as much as possible 
So now here's the idea of uh, the mean, okay, the center of the data. Notice uh, like this is a fulcrum and this is the balance point of this data on, on the scale. This is like a number line. So you have a score of four, a score of three, and a score of eight. So the average of these three numbers is going to be five, right? Uh, or very close to it. It's just, uh, let's see, this is three, four, seven, and eight, 15. Yeah, divided by three, the average is five. So that's the balance point of the data, the center of gravity of this data. Now, if you look at what's going on here, we're looking at the deviations away from the center. So if the score lies below the center, that the deviation is negative. This one has a negative two deviation. And if the score lies above the mean, that deviation is going to be positive. One thing notable here I want you to pay attention to, please, is that if you add negative two, negative one and three, it adds to zero. And is that like a coincidence because the way they make the numbers? Actually, it turns out the answer is no. This is a very interesting mathematical phenomena that happens. And uh, individual deviations, as you can see, they can be positive, they can be negative, depending on whether the score is above or below the mean. However, when you add up all the collective deviations for any data set, it's going to be zero. So what we say technically is that the sum of the deviation from the mean is always zero. And we will uh, make a note of this later in this video when we talk about the measure of, of deviations or dispersions. Okay. Now, the other two measure of central tendency, median and the mode. The median is the middle value. Okay, middle value in an ordered array of listing. The data must be ordered. See, order is the key word here. So if I'm working with raw data, and with raw data, we mean data that has not been processed in any way. It's just the way you collect them. So if I'm working with the raw data, usually we, uh, if you were to do this by hand, you need to order them. And we'll see a couple of examples here. We're going to do ourselves actually a very simple example just to illustrate the idea here. So uh, it's the middle value in an ordered array as you order these from low to high. The other measure of central tendency is the mode. The mode is the value, the most frequent observation, the most frequent observation in your data set. Okay, the one that appears the most. In order for mode to be there, it needs to, the value needs to repeat at least twice, at least twice. So here I've made up an example. Okay, and we want to find out what is the mode in this in this array of numbers. 3, 7, 11, 20, and 8. Now, I have one of each of these, right? So, I don't have a most frequent. Every one of those occur once. So, here's a case where we're going to say the mode, there is no mode. And note, you have to say no mode. I cannot say the mode is zero. Because if I do, that means zero perhaps occurred the most in our data, in our data set. So you got to be careful how you phrase this one. There is no mode for the set of scores. Now, as a measure of central tendency, therefore, if I want to use mode, notice this is a drawback of a mode. It may not exist. Whereas for the median and the mean, they will always exist. So we just saw a drawback of a mode. The fact that the mode may not exist. Okay, and what's the median? So for the median, if I just go and say, ah, uh, the middle value, that would be incorrect. The reason it's incorrect. The median is the middle value. True, it is the middle value. However, we need to do what? We need to sort or order these from low to high. So I'm going to go 3, 7, 8, 11, and 20. There you go. Now that it is ordered, then the middle value, now we can actually see the median is 8. So that would be a representative of the data, or that's the center of our data according to the median. Okay. Now, if you calculate the mean, of course, we quite likely we get a different result. So usually the values of mode, median, and the mean are not quite the same. Very seldom, if ever, they're going to be exactly the same unless we create an ideal situation where we are making up the data and forcing it to happen that way. But with real data, I've never seen it happen. 
But nevertheless, we got uh, these three measures to look at. Now, take a look at this one in this next example. Let's see if you want to find the mode, the most frequent. So let's see, uh, seven. I have two sevens, so therefore the mode is mode equal seven in this case. Now, what if, let's say, oh, actually, sorry, good. I was going to say, what if there's more than uh, one value with uh, at least as many frequency as the other one? In this case, three occurs twice. So the modal scores are three, seven. So this would be an example of a bimodal data. Bimodal means there are two modes. Okay. So, but if they weren't, it'd just be seven. It could have a big data set, typically have multiple modes, a lot of modes. Personally, I've worked with data that that's had hundreds of modes. So that's the other drawback of a mode. It's not unique. I could have several hundred modes in big data sets. So which is the measure of the center? In that case, mode is not really uh, relevant or useful. Okay. Typically, in practice, you either say with the mean or the median. Personally, I always use median as a measure of central tendency, and I will explain why uh, everybody should use median and they just should uh, uh, don't worry about the mean altogether, the arithmetic mean, that is. So we'll get to that. Now, here's an example of from your textbooks. Uh, this is the number of respondents favoring various bath oils. Okay, and for this one, uh, it shows you an example of where mode could be useful here. Notice for one thing, we're looking at favors, right? Those, the favorite bath oil. So your data is qualitative. And with qualitative data, you have to use the mode, right? In this case, mean, median would make sense because I don't have quali quantitative data. So the mode is, in this case, uh, about 350. So the most frequent, the most frequent bath oil that is purchased or used is the one uh, labeled Le Mort. Okay, so that's that shows you where you would be able to use the mode. The least favorite is going to be the rose, right? Bath oils. Rose is the least favorite bath oil in this case. It occurs occurs with the least frequency. Okay, but again, as far as what is the most frequent, the most frequently purchased bath oil is the first one. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, and we'll see, we'll see example, numerical example where you have to actually find mean, median mode. Okay. Remember, we're going to do it from the software. So don't worry about doing things by hand in this course. We're going to use software pretty much for everything just about. Now, here's an interesting, very important, informative diagram. And what I have here is the situations where uh, you have three different distribution here okay so you have a symmetric distribution right that's what this one is for a symmetric distribution in a purely symmetric distribution and again our symmetric distributions don't have to be bell-shaped curve like this i could have a u-shape and it's symmetric like that okay so that would be symmetric I could have a triangular distribution, and that would be symmetric. I could have a uniform distribution, and it's symmetric about the center. Okay, so as long as it's a symmetric distribution. Now, for a symmetric distribution, <clears throat> interestingly, all three measures of central tendency coincide. So we don't have to pick and choose which one we're going to use. We can say, well, I'm going to go with the mean. I'm going to go with the median mode. It does not matter. doesn't matter. Okay, so this is how they align. The three of them will align. In the case of skewed, and this one is a right or positively skewed distribution. Look at how these three align. Okay, the median lies between the mode and the mean. The peak of the distribution is, the, is where the modal value is, right in here. You see that? That's why it has the mode in all three diagrams. The peak is the mode. All three of these distributions are of examples of unimodal distributions, meaning there's only one mode, one peak. 
Okay, the data could be bimodal. A bimodal distribution, for example, may look like that. Okay, in this course, our focus is on single modes, unimodal distributions. Okay, so notice in here again, in a, a right skew distribution, mode is going to be less than median, less than the mean. That's how they align. And it's just the opposite going for the left skew distribution. Mean first, then median, and then mode. In both cases, the median lies always between the mean and the mode. So when I look at an output, and we're going to do that later on with the example that I have. If you look at your output, and if these three measures of central tendencies, these three, are roughly equal, that means we're working with a distribution that is nearly symmetric. Okay, that's if I don't have a histogram to look at and say, oh yeah, this one is symmetric or not. Okay, so hopefully, oops, sorry, hopefully you're okay with this idea of how these three align. Now, the recommendation on which one to use for skewed distributions, for skewed distributions, we never use the mean. Okay, because uh, again, for that reason, because the mean is highly affected by extreme values. Imagine, let's say I want to look at the, how much spending money a community college has uh, on any given day in their pockets, you know, or how much cash people carry on them at any given time. Well, most people don't carry too much cash on them, right? So uh, let's say a person carries $100, $20, $50, and then coincidentally there's this one person who's about to go, let's say, put a down payment on a car or something, and they have $2,000 cash on him. Well, if I put that person in my sample, that person alone is going to um, raise the average, right? So that person will influence or affect the sample mean by, by a wide margin. So for reasons uh, such as that, we always use uh, the median. And remember I said I always use the median is for this reason. For the right or a left skew distribution, we always use median as a measure of central tendency. In a symmetric distribution, they're all the same. So you can't go wrong using median. If you use it here, then you're directly or indirectly using the mean also. And if you use it here, you're supposed to use median here, you're supposed to also. So you're always safe using the median as a measure of central tendency. Okay. And here I have this little, a little piece about uh, the mean, median mode, which one you're supposed to use. So you can uh, always please read this one and, um, and see. Uh, median, I have it here. The median is quite often used for truncated data, so you can read about that. Your book doesn't talk about truncated data, but I did. So, let me keep going. Okay, so that's all as far as the measures of central tendencies go. Now, we're going to take up the idea of the measure of dispersion or spread of your data. And here in this diagram, you're looking at two data sets with two different spreads. Okay, we're talking about uh, how spaced out things are. Notice here they're in a tight, compact formation, whereas here we have more spread out. Okay, so uh, the data above this one, um, this one right in here, this data, uh, it has a lower spread than the one directly below it, correct? the scores are more sparse or spread out. So we want to tap into this. Our formula, therefore, that we're going to develop here is going to be sensitive to these distances, right? The greater the distance of a score from the, the mean, the greater the dispersion or deviation. The closer it is, the smaller the deviation. Okay. Now, here, of course, this example is hourly production of computer monitors at two plants, Baton Rouge and Tucson, for a compute manufacturer of a computer. So it looks like, um, again, the production, the production is really more consistent 
in the Baton Rouge plant as opposed to Tucson. With Tucson, somehow there is widespread in um, in the number of monitors. Notice both of those have, let's say, in both plants, in both of them, they produce on average 50. 50 monitors computer monitors but for some reason the tucson plant it's highly variable for whatever reason that is okay so typically what we like is the smaller variation the reason we like a smaller deviation or variation is this is because it's later on in our inferential work we would like to estimate the averages population average that is the mu so when we uh, when we do that off of a data that has a smaller dispersion then our estimation is going to be more accurate as opposed to estimating something here but then most likely we will see extreme values here and that does not make uh, the center the mean as reliable as we want it to be okay now we're going to look at a couple of measures of dispersion. The first one is pretty simple, the range of scores. And it's pretty easy You do high minus low. High score minus low score, max minus minimum. And that gives you some kind of a spread. So if we look at, for instance, look at the range for this one. Uh, if I look at, um, let's do for Baton Rouge. Okay, so if I look at Baton Rouge, the range is the highest is 52 minus low is 48 so uh, that's in a four point range right that's not bad actually and look at the uh, range of production in Tucson plant the highest is 60 minus lowest is 40 so that's a 20 range that's number of monitors a range in a 20 20 point scale in a range so much wider as opposed to that one now going forward we tend to not work with range okay and the reason because um, we're going to use a standard deviation as a measure of dispersion okay and that's because our formulas require that and that brings us to these formulas again don't worry about working these formulas by hand we're going to use the software but population variance and here's another greek sigma okay again remember there are two sigmas one is a mathematical operator this one the other one is that sigma okay which is what you're looking at so our population variance we're going to go sigma squared population standard deviation the keyword population is the square root of the variance sigma remember sigma is a positive square root of sigma squared okay and the formula by the way for it look at what it's looking at x minus mu is what we call a deviation from the mean so our formula is actually taps uh, it taps into those individual deviations that we looked up earlier and it adds them up and of course um, it looks at the square of the deviation the reason it's looking at the square of the deviation is because uh, if you just look at some of the deviation let me write that for you so you have it or you've seen it if i do sigma x minus mu that's always zero so if i want to get an average deviation my next step i get zero when i divide those individual deviation their total divided by number of deviations i'm gonna get zero so it's for that reason we don't we need to square it and the, and hence again the need for squaring them as you see here okay now um we're not going to use variance in interpretation of dispersion because of that squaring it squares the units so if i'm looking at let's say on average how much does uh, a 20 year old carry on them as far as cash goes or if i want to know what is the average weight of a ups uh, package and with the stand with uh, and i want to measure the deviation in the um, weight of packages at ups then um, this number here, if I calculate sigma squared, this will give me 
number of packages is squared, which will be impossible to interpret. So for that reason, we take the square root of it just to bring it back to the original units of measurements. So for example, now I'm in a position to say things like this. The average weight of a UPS package is about 8 pounds uh, with a deviation of 2 pounds. You see how that goes and, and instead of saying with a deviation of 4 pounds squared. So for that reason, in, in practice, we use um, standard deviation. And then we have those equivalent. Remember I said we have two of every formula in statistics. We literally do. One for the population, one for the sample. A lot of times the formulas draw parallel. They're identical. But here's a case where they're not always the same. If you look at the denominator, and I know one is a square root, the other one is not. I'm not comparing apples to apples. I'm looking at, in one case, deviation, one variance. But let me change that so I make it an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. <laughs> okay, so let's say right in here, I'm comparing two standard deviations, one for the population, one for the sample. The only difference between these, conceptually, is the denominator. See, up here, I have divide by n, square deviation, divide by number of deviations, in the denominator here, we divide by n minus 1. Okay, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, just think of it this way. Maybe the easiest way out of this for me. Uh, when we go to inferential statistics, that means when we want to generalize to the population from the sample. That's the inferential area of a statistics. Um, if we go in there, let's say I want to uh, estimate the population variance or population deviation well we're going to use the samples right if i use the samples to do that and if i don't change the denominator to n minus one it turns out that i am underestimating the variance so there is a mathematical reason beyond it with n minus one everything is good <laughs> and if the sample is large like let's say your sample is ten thousand you're going to divide by 9,999 instead of 10,000. So a lot of times it doesn't make that much of a difference. Okay. And again, I'm not showing you any numerical examples yet. We will see it. We're going to go to Excel and look at it in Megastat and do it in Megastat. And again, for those that are Mac users, because you cannot uh, load Megastat into uh, adding doesn't work with Mac, I will go to... A mini tab and actually whatever I do in Megastat I will show you in mini tab also so you're not at a disadvantage okay so this is our pronunciation key I just want to point this out just so we pronounce things correctly our first symbol was mu and there you go and that's mu of course uh, it just writes it rather than pronounce it for you but I'm pronouncing them for you so that's Greek mu next alphabet we're looking at is sigma sigma this is our mathematical operator remember that means the sum of whatever is in front of it so sigma x means sum of x's right there you go sigma x x with a bar on top that would be the indication of the sample mean and that's how they read it x bar sigma squared that's what this is sigma squared means population variance and that's how they pronounce that one and then of course we have just sigma sigma is the population standard deviation note we got two sigmas here right and that's what i was saying there are two sigmas in greek alphabet one is the operator the other one is population deviation okay so hopefully you're good with all of these let me erase remove these so it looks clean and we're about to leave we're done with the lecture i just want to show you the example and we're going to go to megastat next and we're going to do everything we've done in chapter two chapter three and in the coming chapter four which is more of descriptive measures uh x um what do you call it it's uh, more of exploratory data analysis in the next chapter which all that means is that we're going to look at more statistical graphs in chapter 4.
This is chapter 3. Chapter 3 is mathematical formulas, numerical measures. So, for this data, um, and I have it here, we want to use a software. Any software that you want, again, is fine. I'm not picky. So, if you have a, a TI calculator, that's good, as long as you know how to use it. But again, for this course, since we told you, or the campus mentioned, you have to have uh, Megastat. We're going to use Megastat. Okay, and of course, Minitab as well. So, but anything works. So, what is this data? This data, a sample of households that subscribe to you United Bell Phone Company for landline phone service, reveal the following number of robocalls. So, that's what these are. So, random variable here in this case. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say random, but let's say our variable for now. But later we call it random because the outcome is uncertain as we go out and as these robocalls come in those are random but anyway number of robocalls received per household this is last week uh, determine mean median uh, uh, of the number of robocalls now of course we're going to do more we're just going to do more and as i go to make it stat we're just going to do a whole bunch of stuff to this data even though it just says to do that now this is a sample our sample size is 2 4 6 8 10 12 14 16 right <laughs> there you go i just tallied them quickly so there we go that's our sample size a little n uh, if they told me this is population my boss told me hey this is the population don't worry about sample then n would be 16. Really, the difference between little n and cap n is conceptually one is population, the other sample. Sometimes in our work, we assume you're working with population. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the number of space shuttle disasters, that is a population. Let's say we've had eight of them, two of them, one of them, zero. However many there are space shuttle disasters, uh, that's the population. It's not like, well, we've had... Uh, hundreds of thousands of them and we just a sample of 40 shuttle flights showed uh, three of them were disasters so a lot of them uh, the line that separates little n from capital n is ex uh, is conceptual line okay now i'm gonna pause this video next time you, you see this continuation of this video we're going to be in excel and uh, i've already added in remember i have a video on how to add in megastat in excel so if you haven't watched the video please watch it it's on moodle under the course syllabus below the course syllabus okay and then we're going to do again a whole bunch of stuff with this data okay okay so here i am now i am in excel okay so please if you want to do this and uh, go along with me make sure you can pause the video and you can uh, write these numbers in and we can work them now um this data set is from chapter two so you have this in the previous lecture and if you are copying from what you see writing it on a piece of paper i don't know how you're doing this but i just want to show this so you actually see the scores so these are the scores on an exam and these are the letter grades okay now let's see uh just so you see all of the scores this the scores are 35 99 55 64 and and there you go all the way down to 77 okay so those are the scores and the letter grades are your standard a b c that would be 70 is a c 80 a b 90 and a and so forth in that range now in order to do in chapter two we basically did and you have it again in lecture note we did bar plots of this data and that's what i'm going to do in this video we're going to do a bar graph in order to do a bar graph in megastat you do need to have your raw data it doesn't have to be ordered or anything yeah you, you need those letter grades and you need to create a grade range a grade range so megastat knows how to create a frequency table it builds this frequency table based on these grade ranges and it's going to find 
all of the A's, all of the B, C, D, and F's, and matches them against these. So these, <coughs> so these grade chain, uh, these grade ranges should match the individual grades that's in your data set. Okay, so that's very important. Otherwise, you get frustrated. Things don't work. It gives you error. In chapter three. Now, this is the data on number of robocalls, right, that were received. So you have that data also. And, um, and there you go. This is what they are. There are 16 observations, 16 calls in that. Okay, so first, let's do what we did in Chapter 2, and then we come forward to Chapter 3. In Chapter 2. Um, we did histograms and we did bar graphs, right? And we did frequency tables. So let's do frequency table, relative frequency table, and then we're going to do histogram. We'll do a polygon and all that good stuff. So let's actually take a look at this. So let me begin by a simple. Let's, let's do this. Let's actually do a bar plot of the grades. That's the easiest thing we can do in this lecture for now. So here's a notice in here. I have my add-ins uh, Click on it and I have megastat here. Okay So I'm gonna click on megastat and We're gonna do frequency distribution. That's chapter 2 chapter 2. That's what we did and I'm gonna do frequency distribution for qualitative data Remember these grades a B C D F's these are qualities or attributes characteristics labels however you're going to call them they're categorical so i'm going to click on qualitative now the megastat pop-up is asking okay well where's your input range where's your data click on that and left click once and hold and drag so you click and hold and then once you reach the the end of your data let go of uh, of the mouse click and then you can hit enter <coughs> in order for this to go to the next uh, step okay so there you go enter now and then uh, specification range so click on that now your range, remember the range is going to be actually, let me go up here. The grade range is here, remember? Um, Megastat needs to know the range of your data. And let me tell you, Megastat is not really a powerful in comparison to something like SAS, SPSS, Minitab. So those are by far more, more sophisticated and capable of doing more. But Megastat is, is just fine as an add-in for a lot of people that work in Excel in the work environment or just for whatever reckoning they're doing. Megastat is good enough for them. But then again, it's not as easy to use as Minitab would be. But anyhow, there you go. We're done. Hit enter. And let's see. Well, let me also drag this, bring it lower. Otherwise, you're going to miss something here. Notice down here, by the way, on the lower left, I have data tab. This is not a tab, sorry. That's my worksheet. I just called it data. Uh, in a moment, once I hit OK, Minitab is actually going to create an output uh, worksheet here for me. So let me hit OK and see what happens. And there you go. See that output worksheet that's created? And there you have it. So this is the frequency distribution for qualitative variable, grades A, B, C, D, F. Remember, we copy that range. It just reflects whatever we highlighted. We copied that range. And these are the frequencies, 5, 4, 6, 3, 2. So this would be the frequency table, right? This would be the frequency table right here. And if you look at the next column, these are percentages. These are relative frequencies. 5 divided by 20 is 25 percent that is or 0.25 as a decimal again i have this in my uh lecture for chapter two i have these numbers you can verify them and so on these totals add up to 100 percent so there's your frequency or relative frequency distribution now this is cool 
and this is uh, it calls it histogram but that's fine if you don't like it you can change it oh by the way this output worksheet this is in excel so anything you do to your excel files to your cells you can do to this i don't like histogram because uh, histogram we usually use for quantitative data i'm just going to call this a, a bar chart of grades you see that bar chart of grades now if you like you can highlight it you can jazz it up bold face italicize or whatever again you're in excel so do whatever you want to do to it and there you have the bars you see that and if you hold the mouse i'm not clicking but if you just uh, drag the mouse and hold it over the bar it gives you more information about that bar so for example a it looks like 25 percent got a's okay that's series one don't worry about series one that's the range we highlighted that's series one all of this is came up from one data so it's one series uh, look at C's 30% got C's and the scale here is percent and there you have it A B C D F there pretty easy right now we're going to keep adding to this so it's going to be here uh, if you want you can again copy paste these whatever you do with Excel ordinarily you can do with these there you go uh, uh, selected activated and whatever and uh, you can put it in a PowerPoint you can put it in a Word document in a text document and so on um, and here's the tab uh, you can rename these by the way if you want you don't like this let's say data you can change it output you don't like it you can change it here's how for example i would change the output left click double click output and you can type whatever i like actually output the way it was so there you go we're going to keep it as output if you need to add a worksheet you click this one you see that it adds a new sheet to you to the environment and uh, and that's what that is you see that if you click on this it will add a new one i'm not going to do it but uh, it's there nonetheless okay so we are done with uh just the bar plots now let's do our histogram okay so how do i do a histogram i'm going to click in data in data tab or data worksheet so we did the grades now right let's say i want to do a histogram now of the grades using the raw scores here you see that using the scores i want to do a histogram so i'm going to go to add-ins make a stat and if i go to frequency distributions of quantitative there you go you get a different interface what is my, your input range? Well, my input range is going to be uh, right in here. Okay, and hit enter. Now, for this one, uh, you don't have to choose this. I, I did this momentarily before I actually ran it. That's why these should be blank when you actually reach this pop-up. You can custom inner wallet you have options here don't worry about these equal with intervals is what we like now if if i just keep this i'm not going to put anything else i'm just going to keep it and with this option see leave these field blank for auto estimation then pretty much you're saying to megastat you say well you take control you know what you're doing i don't know what i'm doing just do it for me okay so there you go i'm going to not put anything there and we get a histogram let's get a polygon and you can get an ogive also <clears throat> i didn't mention about polygons and ogives but now that i have it i will tell you about them and hit ok and there you go this is a continuation of remember the grades we had this is a continuation of our output worksheet so this is the frequency distribution again just like this was a frequency distribution oh when this happens that means this column was resized for some reason you want to see what these numbers were come up here until you see this uh you see the double headed arrow double click and it puts it back let me shrink it see that doesn't look good it's not uh it's not reading well just go up here double click and it will uh fit to size okay 
and there you go remember this is where megastat had control over our data so our frequency distribution it decided i'm going to go 30 40 40 50 50 60 60 70 it did a pretty good job actually and the class width right here the width of each bar is 10. the midpoint of 30 and 40 halfway midpoint halfway 35 half 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 and you get these numbers frequency is actually how many scores fall into this category there was no test score between 40 and 50. okay so there you have it and of course these are relative frequencies and then it does a cumulative for you here the cumulative is used in the ogive okay so as you go across these categories you're building up the scores so from 30 to 50 for example one score from 30 to 80 11 scores are in that and the percentages are cumulative percentages they always add up to 100 for the cumulative and there is a histogram okay and that's the histogram of grades now remember in a histogram we typically look for <clears throat> trend we look for a trend we look for symmetry asymmetry any kind of skewness and also we look for outliers it looks like that one student the one student who's got 30 on the score that person is an outlier okay right there's only one score there so maybe this person had a bad day maybe he was he or she wasn't prepared whatever the reason might be or it's just a legitimate score but that one person does not uh, represent the, the the majority the rest of the class okay and there you go now as far as the distribution goes it looks like somewhat skewed to the left right skewed to the left means you have higher values here lower lows here majority of people did pretty good on this exam and this is the polygon now um, in other softwares what they do is actually they put polygon on top of the histogram it was more meaningful the idea of the polygon here is to do what histogram does if you connect the midpoints of these if you connect these midpoints together and anchor them right here if you bring this from midpoint all the way to 105 let's say you anchor the polygon and that's why there is a drop off here and this kind of smooths over the histogram the idea is we like to look at frequency polygons because that way i can you see that general skewness you see there you go this is a left skew distribution that's what polygons are used for now this is the ogive the ogive i didn't mention it but it's there let me tell you about the ogives it's the cumulative uh frequency distribution is what an ogive is and from the ogive we can pretty much do this for example if i look at 70 and project it it looks like 25 percent of people got 70 right 70 or lower 25 percent this is cumulative percent so uh, you don't think of it as seven at, at here on a score of 70 25 percent got 70 that's not true this is cumulative just like look at 90 for example when you go to 90 you're at 75 percent this does not mean it does not mean 75 percent of students got 90. this is pr always less than or equal so 75 percent got less than or equal 90. let's see how many percentage what percentage got less than or equal 60 that means a d pretty much less than a d that means they failed uh, about 10 20 30 40 50 if i project it looks like about 20 percent right there i'm just drawing the line here about 20 percent so that's what the ogive is used for okay and there you go so this was uh essentially chapter two now let's actually go and do chapter three measures of central tendency so we're done with chapter two data let me actually go to chapter three so remember these are the number of robocalls so let's find now everything we talked about here and some of the things we talk we will talk about in the next chapter since i have the data so we're going to find the measures of central tendency and dispersion okay that's your mean median mode and so on so again you're if you're not in add-ins you go in add-ins make a stat very first 
uh, selection first option descriptive statistics and there you go look at that a whole bunch of things now what is checked what is not checked let me uncheck every one of them there are some of those that are by default checked okay so the first thing you need by the way is your input range so my input range I'm gonna include a label calls okay that's not a number right it's a label but I'm gonna include it anyway now if there's a problem with that make a stat will tell me the reason I include it and I like doing that is because if you don't include a label then in the output it just says variable I like my variables to be descriptive so I know what exactly it is I'm doing f and for which variable imagine if I had three four variables it would really help to have a descriptive label on the variables that are being analyzed so now let's do the things that are in chapter three we talked about the mean arithmetic mean we talked about sample variance and sample standard deviation notice it just says sample variance and standard drop the word deviation if you want minimum maximum is free why not let's get them let's get our median and then mode mean median in there it throws it quartiles what quartiles as in quarter one quarter is one fourth right with quartiles uh, these numbers divide data into four equal parts 25 percent 25 percent 25 25 like that so uh, and let's get our box plot let's get our dot plots let's get stem and leaf and normal curve plot i'm going to leave that out we will do this later on when we go to inferential work normal curve plots uh, um, help us determine whether this the distribution follows a normal distribution a bell-shaped symmetric distribution we'll talk more about those next week if you want the total of the scores the, the total of these scores you choose sum and it gives you sum of squares so there you go let's check population variance and population deviation don't worry about confidence intervals the empirical rule let's check that empirical rule says for any data that is mound shape like a bell shape distribution one deviation from the mean contains approximately 68 percent of your scores two deviations 95 three deviations almost all of them 99 percent so 68 95 and 99 that's empirical rule those are one two deviations above or below the mean okay uh the list of the rest of these don't worry if you want skewness kurtosis cb all that we leave those out normal curve goodness of uh, uh, just throw that on there why not so i picked a whole bunch of stuff for you here and let's hit ok and check this out remember this is a continuation so it's like one continuous sheet be careful when you print if you want to print this worksheet a bunch of stuff is going to print and be careful how you're going to print it make sure you select the range and print data that's in in the range now these are the descriptive statistics that we ask for count that's your sample size n and notice by the way the variable see here call that's our x variable number of calls you can even make it more descriptive in your worksheet if you change it to like a number of robocalls then we'll do that and in fact let me go data and this is what i mean see right in here i can change that to number of robocalls and let me size it there you go if you want you can do that and then the output uh, that would you would run it will it will just say that but right now this is not a live data output so any changes you make in here are not going to be reflected back where you just did once uh, make a stat that runs something it's done it terminates it halts the activation so anyway the sample mean 3406 the sample variance 164 sample deviation square root of that 12 almost 13 
the minimum score, uh, the minimum number of calls, that is, not scores, calls, five. The maximum was 52. 52 calls. That's quite a bit in a week. And they're in a 47 point range. The population variance is 154 calls squared, which doesn't mean anything. And population deviation, notice this is 12.4, right? And if I go to homes, remember, this is a worksheet, so you can do whatever you want to it. Anything you do in Excel environment, you can do to these cells. And I want to compare these two for you. Check this out. Okay, so, and there we have it. Notice sample deviation here is almost uh, nine, uh, 13, 12.9. Here's 12.4. So they're off somewhat. The difference here uh, in, in the computation, the denominator here was n minus 1, means 15. Whereas the computation for this, the denominator was 16. So you see that slight discrepancy there. Now, don't use this, okay? In our work, we want to do sample. But I'm just showing you uh, that these are also there. So let me just kind of make them yellow. Just be careful with that. Don't use these. Here's your empirical rule. Remember, I said one, two deviations, one, two, three. So, if you do mean plus minus one deviation, that means one. That means sixty-eight, roughly sixty-eight percent of uh, calls received, uh, or sixty-eight percent of household receive anywhere from twenty-one to forty-seven robocalls a week. There you go. See, sixty-eight point two six. That's percent in the interval. And this is the actual percentage. Remember, the empirical rule, the word empirical means based on data. Empirical rule doesn't change. It's 68, it's 68, 95, 99. Of course, I left those decimals out for you. It's easier to remember this way, 68, 95, 99. These are the actual what happened. Notice they're not too far off. 99.73, actually that was 100% with this data. 9544, pretty close. 68, uh, off a little. But anyway, uh, two deviation. That means empirical rule says about 95%, almost all calls, 95% uh, received anywhere from eight, any house, households received anywhere from eight to almost 60 robocalls uh, in a week. The actual percentage in the sample, 94%. That happened to them, and so on. Look at this one, negative 4 calls to 72 calls. That's just uh, what the mathematics turns out to be. If you do plus minus 3 deviation, it's impossible to get negative calls, right? But it's just there because that's how the math works. Now, here are quartiles. First quartile, 30. That means 25%. Remember, quarters. One, tw first quartile means 25%. 25% of the sample participants received 30 or fewer calls a week median 50 percent received 37 and a half calls right how can you get 37 and a half calls right it's remember these are all computed that's why they don't round them they leave them the way they are third quartile means 75 percent or lower 75 percent of the sample households or households in the sample received uh, 42 calls in a week. Now, that means 25% got even more than that, right? So you can look at it from the other end. The interquartile range, this is if you take Q3, third quartile, minus Q1. If you subtract 30, that 30, and this is 42 and a quarter. If you subtract 30 from 42 and a quarter, you get 12 and a quarter. The interquartile range, this number, it looks at the range. Remember, range is a measure of dispersion or spread. So this number is looking at the measure of a spread for the middle 50%, the middle 50% of scores. So a lot of people look at the inner quartile range as opposed to just the range. Remember the range up here, 47. This is rather wide range, almost 50 when you go to the middle 50% 50, they're not as variable only 12 well, what does that tell me that just tells me that a good number of scores they bunch about the median right they bunch about the median 
and uh, they're in a 12 point range so uh, again that just tells me the the spread of the data is kind of tightly wrapped around the median uh, the mode the most frequent is 46 okay so if I go to my data here and let's see if we can find 46 46 here's 146 I'm gonna highlight 46 with green let's see any other 46s aha uh -huh, there you go 246s right and I don't see anything else that's being repeated more than once nope no I don't so that's what that is okay 46 that's gonna be our mode go to output tab okay and then uh, what else here the low extremes low outliers oh uh, high outliers extreme outlier okay this this is done um, because of a box plots okay the normal curve uh, p-values okay this don't worry about these in fact I shouldn't even bother with these I'm gonna delete them for you so not to confuse you and there you go this is a stem and leaf display we'll talk about this this is now chapter 4 okay from here on we're in chapter 4 so I'm gonna do the data now then I do the lecture for chapter 4 separately so the stem and leaf display is kind of like a histogram on its size with a stem and leaf you actually use the values so stem, uh, all numbers have two parts they have a representation with the stem and then the leaf just like on a tree so a 0 5 means the score uh, this means a uh, number of calls 5 notice it says a stem unit 10 leaf value 1 okay so uh, 1 2 this is like 10 and 2 makes 12 see you leaf unit is 1 so that's 2 and 10 12 1 8 means 18 0 stem means stem unit 10 0 10 0 leaf is 1 unit 5 so that's just 5 one score so one sample data had a value of five that means they received five calls robo calls in a week and then this is 12 12 18 30 30 32 34 37 38 39 see how cleverly this is put together actually the gentleman who put this together it was professor john tukey of princeton university who did this who put this stem and leaf display together the idea of a stem and leaf the timeline is about the like um, 1940 late 1940 uh, early 1950 okay and of course he passed in 19 July of 1980 um, okay now look at 5 2 again stem unit 10 5 means 5 times 10 50 leaf unit 1 2 so that means 2 times 1 is 2 so that's 52 the good thing about the stem and leaf you can see uh, in here if you note I can see the maximum I can see the minimum okay and this is your sample size 16 so very informative what do we get out of this again if you look at this this is like uh, a histogram on its side if you turn this 90 degrees it looks just like a histogram and in fact with large data then it does become a histogram now next we're going to look at the box plot now the box plot is put together using five numbers it looks at the minimum the maximum the inside the box is the, where the median is right in here you see that 37 and a half that's the median right in here the lower edge of the box is where the first quartile is you see that 30 right 30 comma 2 look at the quartile uh well the median is the second quartile where does where's the median right in here see the median is 37 and a half right so that's what this number is the median oops sorry i don't know what i did if i hold the mouse over it you see 37 and a half that's the value in quotation is the value of that so this is where the median is in quotation that's where q3 is that's the third quartile 42 and a quarter the fourth uh, the fourth oh, i'm sorry q3 q3 
that's the fourth quartile, Q3. With quartiles, we have Q1, Q2, Q3. Q2 is the median. Q1 is the first quartile, it means 25% or below it. Okay, so this is Q3. 75% of the scores are less than 42 and a quarter. And this is the third quartile. See that? 42 and a half. Now, what do we get out of this and why do, what's the separation here? Um, what Megastat has done here is actually uh, looked at outliers. So it's, it was able to found an outlier. Remember that one student who got the score of 30. There you go. If you hold on it, it tells you that. One, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This is number of calls, not. Yeah. Number of calls. So this household received only five call in one week. Okay. So that would be according to this box plot. That's an outlier okay and it is a mild outlier <clears throat> because it's outside of this line notice there's another line here this is extreme outlier okay which is located at negative 6.75 these lower limits these lines we call these fences so this is a lower fence this is a lower fence there are no upper fences for this data although theoretically they're there you don't see them but uh, Megastat didn't even draw these because none of the scores went over the fence on the high side. On the low side, one score jumped the first fence. So this first one, vertical line, this is what we call the lower. On the left is lower, to the right is upper. If it's the lower inner fence, this is the lower outer fence. On the high side, if there was one, there would be a fence here. There would be, let's say, a fence here. The first one is going to be upper inner fence. Next to that, further away, would be the upper outer fence. Inner outer. Inner outer. Lower upper. <laughs> okay. So anyways, um, usually um, if we don't exclude these outliers and the whiskers that come out of the box, see the lines coming out of the box, we call those whiskers. These whiskers are going to be longer. Now, what does this box plot tell me? Just summarize it. Aside from the outlier, if you look at the longer the whisker means the more drawn out this tail end of the distribution is. So this is the box plot of data that is left skewed, the box plots. So um, when I do the lecture on the box plots, I'll show you what kind of box plots we're trying to keep in mind. Uh, going forward, we use box plots in order to decide on the shape of the distribution, whether it's right skewed, left skewed like this one is, or whether it's symmetric. We'll see box plots of all three of those later on in in the next lecture and here's a dot plot again dot plots look at look at the spread of the data points see how spread out they are they do not bunch all they, they don't bunch about the center the average what was the average number of calls here mean 34 so that would be score here that's right about here that's where 34 is the center so look at how spread this data is. It, its deviation is rather large. The bigger the deviation means the less representative the mean is as a measure of typical or central tendency. So if they say, well, okay, so uh, I'm an average household. How many robocalls should I expect in a week? According to this data, I should expect about 34. But I'm sure I'm not going to get 34 because of the widespread that you see in this data. Okay, so uh, that's why we go 68%, 95%, 99% to give us some kind of a range. Okay, and there you go. So we did everything in chapters 2, 3, and 4. So let me recap. Up here, this is chapter 2, up to here. This is chapter 2, not up to here, sorry, including that. And that this is chapter two in chapter. Uh, I'm sorry. This is chapter two, <laughs> chapter two. All of those were chapter two, but I never mentioned all jives or uh, polygons in my lecture. But now you've seen it. Now, here is chapter three, beginning of chapter three, all the descriptive stats. Remember the formulas. 
chapter three, three, uh, and that's it. This is chapter three. All of these numbers are chapter three, numerical measures. This is the beginning of chapter four, stem and leaf, box plots, and dot plots. Okay. And with that, we are done with this video. Now I'm going to do this, what we've just done here. I'm going to do it in Minitab. For those who have Minitab, if you don't have Minitab, you have Megastat, you're done. You can stop the video and um, you can do whatever else, else you like. Or if you're just curious, you would like to learn more and see how Minitab, how different it looks, how it's done in Minitab, stick around and I'll show you that. So I'm going to pause the video momentarily. Next time you see this, we're going to be in a whole different environment. We're going to be in Minitab. Okay, so what I have done, I've actually invoked Minitab. So I have now Minitab up and running, not in here. This is Excel in it, still in Excel, but I have Minitab on my desktop. Okay, and by the way, in case you wonder, I'm using a Surface Pro for all of this. So here's how you can actually do this without, um, if you have this, let's say in Excel, you can bring it into Minitab. So I'm just going to go highlight these columns. And there you go. And right click. I'm going to copy. And I'm going to bring up Minitab right in here. And I'm going to go uh, Control V. And it pastes it. You see that? Right in here. Now, notice grays F, A, F, D, C, like that. These are. Uh, qualitative right and that's what c2 column 2 t means text that means uh, at this point minitab has recognized this as a qualitative uh, variable okay that's what that is okay and also uh, in this column i have a scores right so we have scores here we have grades here uh, and that was just a copy paste and while i'm at it let me also bring up uh, this other one, the number of robocalls, right? Let me carry these. So you highlight, right click, copy, and I'm going to copy and paste it, control V into this one. So now I have both data sets in here. Okay, so let's do our frequency uh, distributions here, right? All right, so we have all our data in here. Okay. Now, let's say we want to do a bar chart or bar plot of the grades. And you go to graph. Now, notice here, by the way, do you see how, how much more advanced, how much <laughs> better this product is than Megastat, of course, served for different purposes. Minitab is, is much bigger company that uh, the company that put megastat together okay but anyway megastat is just uh, an add-in for excel they serve their purpose and these people are serving a different audience okay so you go to graph and we want to do a bar plot right so you go down here but look at all the charts by the way all the different graphics that are available in this so i'm going to go to a bar chart we'll keep it simple and in fact here our choice is simple keep your default what it is hit OK and <clears throat> in here um, Minitab recognizes the variables in column 1 2 3 we want to do this for grades right so you can cl single click once select or double click on grade okay now let's go to chart options if you like you can keep it default default means as the way the data appears so let's say i started uh, with an a in my column so it's going to go a and then b was next it's going to see b if it d was next it's going to use d or you can go increasing you can go decreasing order of grades let's let's do all three so here's default hit okay and that's good enough hit okay again and you'll see the histogram this is what i had in my lecture you see that and we'll click on it and it brings it outside there you go notice this is the natural order that they appeared in my in my spreadsheet <coughs> it looks like the most frequent grade was c followed by a then b then d 
hit OK. Now, if I want to say, well, what I just said, can I see it visually? Sure. You go to bar chart, OK, and chart options. I'm going to go in, uh, let's go in uh, decreasing. So I see the most frequent grade first and second most and so on. Decreasing order and hit OK. And there you go. So this is decreasing, you see. The highest grade is C, then it's A, followed by B, by D, by an F. And this is usually a decreasing uh, chart like this. This is called a Pareto, a Pareto chart. So and there you have it. You can change it to increasing and what have you. So uh, that's what that is. We're done with the grades. Now with the scores, let's do a histogram of scores. So you go graph. And I want to do a histogram, right? So there you go histogram of and we're going to keep it simple oh with a fit uh with a fit let's go with fit just so you see what it does this is what i wish megastat would do but that's fine we're going to do it notice by the way because histograms are done for quantitative variables so that variable grade is now um selected because remember uh minitab recognizes that um, column two grade is text the variable is categorical so it's not going to even show that okay so what am i going to pick um let's do histogram of both if you want why not there you go i didn't do histogram of robocalls but there it is <clears throat> and uh, let's just go okay and uh, there you go now of course these are um just default right what um minitab did remember this is very similar to what we had this is for scores it it throws in a normal distribution on top of it and the reason so you can kind of visually see how far off you are from normality and there you go <clears throat> the bar value is that gives you the mean deviation sample size Notice, interestingly, it uses capital N for sample size. So, anyway, it's just a mini tab. And this was for number of robocalls. There you go. So that's how you get your histograms in mini tab. Now, let's do something else. Um what else oh let's do all of those that's all we want to do with scoring grades right uh let's go to our number of robocalls that's the one that i did all those other stem and leaf dot plot box plots and stuff so let's do a dot plot and that's a simple dot plot okay uh we're going to do it for a number of robocalls and okay And there's your dot plot. It looks just like uh, the one in Megastat. And of course, again, with Minitab, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do here. You can explore these. For those that have Minitab, you can explore those on your own. I just want to show you <coughs> basic functionalities here. You can spend years in Minitab alone trying to master this. Let's go graph. Next, we go to stem and leaf stem and leaf of number of robot and don't worry about by variables see trim outliers don't worry about that and increment don't worry about it this is a stem and leaf right and there you go stem and leaf number of robot calls x and for this one the leaf unit is one so again here this would be 05 12 18 now one thing you notice here by the way you have two stem values one one two two three three four four like that uh the stem and leaf that we saw in let me bring up excel since i have it oh this is so cool i can do this now okay let's look at the stem and leaf that we saw there you go it's like well how come this is different well the stem and leaf here it it shows it uses one stem for one so 12 and 18 are together imagine if 
data file you have too many data points this line is going to stretch all the way to here so that doesn't look good so we can actually break the stem into like two lines <clears throat> excuse me two lines per stem three lines per stem so on and so forth so what minitab has done is broken one into one two lines per stem so it puts digits 0 1 2 3 4 in one line and then 5 6 7 8 9 in the second line so 12 and 18 in minitab are going to look like this that's going to be 1 2 12 that's 18 okay you have control over that also i believe in um let me go to add-ins i want to see it in uh descriptive measures St uh, yeah there you go let me redraw that the stem and leaf okay just the stem and leaf we don't need any of that other stuff you see right here is split stem and leaf plot let's if you click split it will do what minitab did and there uh yeah there you go you see that one two one eight two two three three four four five it looks just like minitab now so it, it splits it into two lines per stem here so that's identical to that one cool and oh, this keeps a summary of the session the things i've done here's chart of grade chart of grade histogram dot plots stem and leaf okay now next i did a box plot so i'm gonna go graph stem and leaf probability empirical oh, there you go here's our box plot now box plots some call them box and whiskers plot and we do it for number of robocalls and again scale labels data options multiple data view just go basic default and there you go this is like a vertical box plot minitab does uh vertical box plots and right in here notice there is your outlier remember that one household that received five calls per week that's that one so it's using the same idea actually that uh, what you call it um the same thing that uh, megastat was doing so right in here again you can accomplish those tasks also in there and that's the list of our visual displays now let's get our numbers our statistics you go to stat basic stats and here's a whole bunch of stuff for those that have minitab later on when we do hypothesis tests confidence intervals all of that good stuff they're all right in here see how easy that is so let's go display descriptive statistics for let's do it for we did it for robocalls right yeah there you go robocalls and if you want graphs click on it you can also get your box plot here you can get your histogram here that's pretty cool Hit okay now these are the statistics it's kind of similar to megastat right with some defaults pre-selected let's get the mean deviation variance uh minimum maximum range number of missing no missing no percent sure that would give us um what you call them, that give us our uh relative frequencies first quartiles notice there is no second quartile the second quartile is the median first quartile that's q1 means 25 percent below it median is q2 50 percent below that third quartile q3 75 percent below that score interquartile range that's q3 minus q1 remember the variation for the middle 50 percent of your data and let's get the mode some squares the skewness kurtosis is very much very much folks like megastat hit okay okay again and there you go i like this better <coughs> display better than in megastat it occupies less space and everything is kind of right in front of you uh the horizontal format is personally that's just my preference so descriptive statistics for number of robocalls x and there they are we already talked about all of these so that is how you're going to get it from minitab and again if if you can always purchase minitab if you like um, and uh, do this kind of stuff for your work for your uh, other classes and what have you so with that we are done displaying everything 
um, that we had to do so our work is complete so we're really done with chapters 2 3 and 4 um, so I'm not gonna do mini tab and make stat demos in my next lecture which would cover chapter 4 because we've just seen them all here okay uh, we're done with this lecture <laughs>